This video is a ministry of the First Baptist Church, Pampa, Texas. We are located at 203 Northwest Street in downtown Pampa. Join us for worship this Sunday or visit us on our website at firstpampa.org. Now enjoy the rest of the broadcast. Turn in your Bible this morning with me to Genesis chapter 2, and then we'll also be in Genesis chapter 3 next Sunday morning, I want to conclude this series uh, that we've entitled Created, and you might think that this is an unusual passage to go to for a Thanksgiving message. A lot of times people say, well, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, you have to teach, uh, preach a Thanksgiving sermon. So we're going to go to the Garden of Eden and talk about original sin on Thanksgiving Sunday morning. You might not think that's it, well, here's, here's the key. An important and essential element to living a consistently victorious Christian life is the ability to keep a Godward perspective. And it is possible, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter what reality might be in your life or in the world, it is possible to have uh, things about which or for which we can be thankful. So this morning, I want to share with you several reasons we can be thankful for the garden and for uh, that experience that we will look at here in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. Even in the Garden of Eden, where sin was born, hope can still be found. Look with me, beginning in Genesis chapter 2, I want to read uh, starting in verse Verse uh, 4, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground the Lord God formed the man from dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed, and the Lord God made all kinds of trees uh, to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden there was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of of good and evil. And then verses uh, 10 through 14 tell the, the location of this garden. Pick up with me in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Over in chapter 3, go to Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, you may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The remaining part of that chapter goes on to describe their reaction to sin and then God's condemnation of sin. We'll look at that next Sunday morning. There are some, some reasons that we can find thanks in the garden. And you might just look at that and go, what, what hope comes from a situation of original sin? Well, let me just walk through uh, several different aspects this morning. Five, actually, reasons that you can give thanks for the Garden of Eden. Number one, be thankful that we live and move in the splendor of God's creation. Be thankful that we live and move in the splendor 
of God's creation. This past week, actually Sunday night into Monday morning, we started out the week with, a, with our area covered with a blanket of snow. You know, I don't know that there's ever any more beautiful uh, time than when you see just that, that uh, unless, I know some of you went ahead of me right then, you're thinking, yeah, but I have to go out and work in it. Don't jump ahead of me. Just look straight out the window and see that the ground or the, the mountains that we don't have near us, but just picture everything just covered with that fresh blanket of snow. Just perfect. It's pristine. It's peaceful. That's kind of like what the Garden of Eden experience was like. When God first created it, and he, he took Adam and he set him in the garden. What Adam saw was the, this garden was covered with the glory of God. Kind of like when we look out and we see that, that fresh blanket of snow covered with the glory of God. But there's also one thing that we see when we see that, that fresh blanket of snow absent from the presence of sin. When Adam looked around the garden, he saw covered with the glory of God and absent from the presence of sin. But you know what happens about the second day after a good snow? It's nasty, isn't it? It just starts looking terrible. And then as it, as it starts melting, I mean, you're driving down the road, you hadn't seen a clean car in, in miles and miles, and it just, it just looks bad. Well, that's what sin does. That's what sin does to God's creation. It corrupts it. It tarnishes it. It, it. it dirties it. But the presence of sin aside, God placed Adam and then created Eve, placed them together in the Garden of Eden. And in it, he gave them three uh, purposes that they should carry out within the garden and then one prohibition. And those, even in our day, those purposes for experiencing God's creation, as well as the prohibition, are still active, are still present and still applicable to us. So let me share with you what those are. Uh, three purposes found in the Garden of Eden, and then one prohibition. First purpose that they experienced in the Garden of Eden was to wonder at its beauty. To wonder at its beauty. Verse 9 says that they looked around the garden, it was pleasant uh, in his, his sight. It was pleasing to the eyes. In, in our world in which we live, we have a purpose and an opportunity. So purpose doesn't necessarily mean bad. Sometimes we think purpose, obligation, work. No, it doesn't necessarily mean bad, but one of the opportunities we have living in this creation is to enjoy the beauty of what God has done. If, if you don't do that, you're missing out. If you don't do that uh, consistently, maybe every few months or something like that, but honestly, if you, if, if you go through the course of a day and you miss out on the splendor of God's creation, then I think we're missing out on a gift that he's given us. He's given us the opportunity to live in this creation and to wonder at who he is. Not necessarily to wonder at creation itself, but to wonder at the God who created all of this. The intricacies of his creation are far superior than anything that man could ever begin to imagine or design. And God did that, and he placed us within his creation. So one of the opportunities we have is to wonder at his creation. The second purpose in uh, placing Adam and Eve in the garden was to work it, to work it. We have the purpose to, to tend, uh, to cultivate, to make use of the resources of creation. It's our responsibility to do that, our responsibility to work it and take advantage of what God has given us, and that's how we, uh, that's how we, we live and move and, and supply one another, supply ourselves and supply our, our living and so forth. It is appropriate to make use of the resources that God has given within his creation. Third purpose is to watch over it, to protect it, uh, to, to care for it, if you will, to steward it. We should be good stewards of God's creation. Now, there's one prohibition that he gave them when they were in the garden. 
And the prohibition was not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, this, this has to do with that. The fourth, and I listed it here on this same list, but not a purpose but a prohibition that we have in nature, in creation, is to not worship it. To not worship it. You might say, well, I've never worshipped uh, creation. Well, maybe you haven't, maybe you have. But there are people that do, and there is the tendency to do that. If you have your copy of God's Word there, turn over to Romans chapter 1, or just write these, these uh, verses down in your notes. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Listen to what Paul says here about, and it, it leads up to, to what man does with creation. It says, The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men, who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And then listen to this. And they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. They worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. God has given us the opportunity to live in this paradise, in this creation, this gift that He's given us. And in so much as He has placed us here, we have the opportunity to appreciate the beauty of God, to wonder at its beauty. We have the opportunity to work within creation, to, uh, to, to, to tend it, to cultivate it, to make use of its resources. We have the opportunity and obligation to be good stewards of God's creation, never to abuse creation, but to steward it, to watch over it, and so forth. But here's the problem. Some people get confused with stewarding God's creation and worshiping God's creation. There are some people that have this understanding that to be a steward of creation means that we, we uh, acknowledge, and, and, and so much as they would even say that God exists in a tangible element of creation. The, the big 25-cent seminary word for that would be pantheism, that God is... Uh, in that tree, and that tree is God. That God is in that cotton plant that made the pews that you're sitting on, and that is God. So you're sitting, all matter, they would say, is God. But what happens then is they've taken the created things and raised them to the level of being equal, and even with creation, and they begin to worship creation. We teased a number of years ago about the tree huggers, the environmentalists. It's appropriate for us to be uh, environmentally uh, conscious and be good environmental stewards, but it is completely inappropriate to elevate environmentalism to a point that it really becomes worship of creation. And it's really important for us as we live in God's creation to recognize what it is, recognize the opportunities that God has given us within creation, but then also to be, uh, to be cognizant of the fact that we do not worship creation, we worship the Creator. So first this morning, what good can we learn of the garden? We can be thankful that we live and move in the splendor of God's creation. Secondly, be thankful that our enemy has been revealed from the beginning. Be thankful that our enemy has been revealed from the beginning. We have an enemy. 
And our enemy is not God. Our enemy is not yourself. Our enemy is not your spouse. Our enemy is not your neighbor. Our enemy is the serpent, which Re Revelation chapter 20, verse 2 says, the old serpent, which is Satan, which is the devil. He's also called the adversary. He's called the father of lies. He's called the enemy. He's called the deceiver. And we should be thankful that God has revealed who the enemy is from the beginning. Say, so, well, why in the world would you be thankful for that? Well, turning a blind eye to truth only results in disillusionment and destruction. Why should we be thankful for it? Because it's true. We don't have to be thankful that we have an enemy. Don't misunderstand me, but we should be thankful that God revealed to us who the enemy is from the beginning. That's important for us to acknowledge, important for us to, to understand. We have to know that God has uh, allowed us to identify the enemy because it is truth. There's some people that just want to ignore it and hope that, oh, nothing will happen. Well, let me give you a, a little piece of advice. Why don't you just ignore paying taxes for about 10, 15 years? Then let me know how that turns out. Let me know how that turns out. Well, you can't do that, can you? It catches up, and the consequences mount up. The penalties over, I don't have firsthand experience in that, but the penalties would mount up, and you would, you would face dire consequences if you just tried to ignore reality. Well, the same thing's true if we ignored the fact that we have an enemy. If we ignored who our enemy is, then the consequences would just mount up. Turning a blind eye would just lead to disillusionment and ultimately destruction. So we should be thankful that God identified the enemy from the beginning. Well, imagine that we grow up knowing that we have an enemy, that as Christians we say, we, you know, we believe in enemy, but, but what, if we, what if we didn't know who the enemy was? Uh, imagine... <laughs> The insecurity, imagine the fear that we would live in if we couldn't identify the enemy. But see, God wants us to be able to identify the enemy. That's why he, he revealed who the enemy is. It's the serpent, it's Satan, the devil, the deceiver, the father of lies, the enemy. So we should be thankful that God has identified the enemy from the beginning. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be alert, be watchful. Because our enemy, the adversary, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. If you think just because you're a follower of Jesus Christ that the enemy will, will, will stand back and go, Oh, I, I can't I impact their life then you're being deceived. No, we can't be inhabited by the enemy, but we can be oppressed and afflicted by the enemy. We live in a world that's tainted because of sin that was founded in this very chapter. And God wants us to be alert, be aware that there is an enemy. And that enemy is the enemy of God. That enemy is not God. Some people think God is their enemy. No, God, God is on your side. God is on your side because the Creator knows the ultimate purpose and desire for His creation. But know and be thankful that God identified the enemy. Third, uh, this morning, the reason we can be thankful, even in the Garden of Eden, be thankful that all truth and knowledge rests, is founded in God. They were told to stay away from that one tree. You, you'd think it would be so simple. Have you ever asked a child, okay, you can, you can do anything you want to, but just don't touch that one thing. You know what we do. That's the first thing we go to. And it's not just uh, the reason our children do that and our grandchildren, because we did the same thing. The reason we did the same thing is because Eve and Adam did the same thing. When God says no, it's like, whew, they're drawn to that. 
and then the enemy says, and we, we sometimes I'll read this and I'll try to, to impose this, whatever the devil sounds like, you must not surely die, you know, this sinister uh, type of a tone. You know, I really don't think it was like that. I think the enemy, the serpent, spoke to Eve in a very deceptive, pleasing tone. Because if temptation was, was apparent that it was evil, then we'd resist it. But so much of temptation is pleasing. And even the sound of temptation is pleasing to us. But know this, all truth and knowledge is founded in or rests in God. This is a foundational principle of Christianity. If we abandon this foundational truth, then everything else we believe begins to crater and begins to fall. Foundational to who we are, foundational to what Christianity is, is the, the truth that, that uh, all knowledge, all truth is founded in God. If it's denied that all truth is in God, then man would seek to become like God. Let me give you some examples of how that, that works. First off, we, we are not God. <laughs> so just as the enemy wanted them to, oh, you can be God, you can be like God. We're not God, so we can't. Secondly, we cannot become a God. As the Mormon church, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I hate even using that name because using the name Jesus Christ associated with a lie, I think is completely inappropriate. The Mormon church believes that a person can attain Godhood. We cannot, all truth, all knowledge resides in, it's rested in, it's founded in the one true God. And the idea that we can become a God goes back to their original temptation to sin. Third thing, we cannot create other gods according to cultural impulses. We cannot create other gods according to cultural impulses uh, as, such as is taught by the Eastern religions, Hinduism and so forth. The Hindu people have literally millions of gods. And when I say that, I'm using a lowercase little g. Millions of gods. So what, what has happened through the ages, as a need came about, as a desire came about, they just created a new god. Oh, if it were so simple. In fact, it would be disastrous if it was. There's only one God, and all truth, and I mean that with a capital T, all truth is founded in the one God. And if we ever abandon that truth, the foundation upon which we stand and upon which Christianity is built begins to crumble. Don't ever give up that one fact. Don't ever give up the validity and the reliability of the creation account. And some people do that and say, oh, you can believe in God. You don't have to believe the first 11 chapters of Genesis. That's just all allegory. That stuff doesn't really, didn't really happen. It doesn't really matter. It was just, it's just a story to create a sin problem. No, it matters. <laughs> because when we abandon what God has said in his word, the foundation of who we are begins to crumble. And then all other ground is sinking sand. But on Christ, the solid rock, we stand. Because in him is all truth. The fourth element we learn about being thankful that all truth and knowledge rests in God is we cannot determine truth apart from the absolute authority of Almighty God. I hear people sometimes say, well, they're on, a, they're on a quest for truth. They're trying to determine what religion is real by, 
by trying to see what, what, what's true. The only true truth can be acquired by acknowledging the absolute authority of Almighty God. Anything else is not truth. Anything else might be assumption. It might be uh, an allegation. It might be just a, a fleeting uh, thought that somebody tries to hold on to. But true truth is based and founded in God. Fourth principle for which we can be thankful. Be thankful that God is true to his word. Be thankful that God is true to his word. Later in chapter 3, we read the, the consequences of original sin. We'll come back to that uh, in, uh, next week. Let me just say this. While many would situationally want God to overlook disobedience, think of the uncertainty that would bring. But the holiness of God demands that sin be punished. Let me give you the last point, and then I'll wrap up and want to read one other scripture for you in Ephesians chapter 1. The last point this morning, then I'll pick up more on, on points 4 and 5 next week. Be thankful that God has determined from the beginning to provide redemption through Jesus Christ. Be thankful that God has determined from the beginning to provide redemption through Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1. Let's listen to verse 7. Actually, if you want to just jot down your notes, write Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3, uh, 3 through 10. But listen to verse 7. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Verse 4 says, He chose us in him before the foundation, before the creation of the world. Be thankful that even before Adam and Eve's fall in the garden, God had already chosen redemption for mankind through Jesus Christ, his son. Would you stand with me with your heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment? 